Oh, I'm so excited this morning <laughs> because we are going to be starting one of my most favorite books in the Bible. Now, I love all 66 books of the Bible. Let me start with that. But the book of Ephesians is a book that brings home to us so much about our glorious riches in Christ. And as a fellowship of believers, we understand what it means to be the church, what it means to be the body. So we're going to be starting the book of Ephesians, and we'll be in it for a, for a while, studying verse by verse through the epistle. But we're going to take some times where we're going to zoom out and get some big picture looks, and we're going to zoom in and get the intricacies of what Paul is teaching us from this glorious epistle. And I want to say to you, by way of introduction this morning too, that one of the things that Ephesians is going to help you to see is who you really are. Because a lot of believers don't really know who you are. For example, did you know that when you received Jesus Christ, you became a corporate identity? You became a member of the household of faith and one part of the broader body of Christ? You became a body part. You literally are a hand or a foot or, or, or something related to the bigger picture of the body of Christ. Now, let me say this. There are three ways you can, you can see you can be seen in this world. Three ways you can be seen. Number one, how others see you is how you can be seen. How do people see your life? That's one way. Number two, how do you see yourself? I don't just mean by looking in a mirror, but what do you think about yourself? What do you, how do you view yourself? But the third way is another way to, on how you can be seen. And that's how God sees you. Now, if I was to ask you, which one is always perfectly accurate? The way others see you, the way you see you, or the way God sees you? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? How God sees you is your true identity. Well, if what God sees is always true, then what God says is going to be key for you in knowing who you are. See, I know who I am because of what God says about me. I am who you say that I am. That's what is true for every believer. Whatever God says to us in his word is always true. And let me just tell you this. Jesus says it like it is. Jesus always tells us the truth about life and about us. In fact, not only did he create us, not only did Jesus speak to us, but he became one of us. And when he became one of us, he brought heavenly truth down to us in a way that's knowable and relatable. And so Jesus, when he came to this earth, he took a dysfunctional world that's fallen in sin and he helped to restore the identity we've lost because of the fall of man. Do you know that our world today is having an identity crisis? Does that surprise anyone here? Our world is having an identity crisis. But I want you to understand that that makes total sense. I'm not surprised that people are confused as to who they are. Because you can never know who you are if you don't know who God is first. And if people don't know God, they don't know themselves. And if they don't know themselves, they'll let everybody else define and refine and select and correct who they ought to be. And that's a scary thing today. But let me tell you this. I have good news for you. Jesus never went through an identity crisis. <laughs> Jesus always knew who he was. In fact, in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said in John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Oh, Jesus knew exactly what he was saying, and he knew who he was. But when he asked his disciples who he was, he had to help them out. Do you remember? He says, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Isn't it interesting how Jesus actually declares his identity when given the opportunity for others to, to even answer who he is? And the reason why is Jesus wants there to be no mistake about it. Although Jesus didn't always come out and declare openly who he was, for all of those who were seeking, all those who are searching, Jesus didn't hide who he was either. Jesus wants it to be known that he is the son of man and that through him, we have access to the father. 
We have access to the Father to, to come boldly to the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We also can freely receive of God of all of the heavenly resources that are available to us. See, Jesus gives us back the identity we lost and adds to it when Adam could have had more. See, the identity we have as believers today is even greater than what Adam knew in the garden. Because although Adam was made in the image and likeness of God, Imago Dei, this idea of the image of God, never before has mankind been the home for God to make his home in where Jesus is now dwelling in humanity so that the identity of Jesus is so intimately related and connected to our identity. So Jesus wants to restore our identity. The message this morning is called Our God-Given Identity. And we're going to turn to Ephesians 1 where we begin today's message. Would you turn there with me? Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read the passage of Scripture, just in reverence of God's Word and in respect to the fact that these words define who we are. These are the words of eternal life, and we want to honor the Lord as we read His Word. We read these words in the opening of this letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence." This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to the God of his word. Father, we open up our hearts to receive from you the implanted word, which is able to save our souls and restore our identity. God, we ask today for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your son, Jesus, that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened and that we might know what is the hope of your calling and what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. Lord, we ask you to teach us as the church, to guide us into the truth, to enlarge our hearts, and that we might be a living testimony in this world of what it means to be the church living today. A city on a hill, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, your called out people. Father, speak to us by your Holy Spirit, very personally, very practically, and very powerfully. We ask this in Jesus' name, for your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So as I mentioned, the book of Ephesians teaches us about our collective identity. And you know what I love about the epistles? Let me tell you something about the epistles of Jesus. I say the epistles of Jesus because although the apostles wrote the epistles, the epistles are the expanded teachings of Jesus Christ. You say, well, wait a minute. That's not true. I thought the Gospels is what Jesus speaks. Yes, but Jesus says, I must go and leave with you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And afterwards, he will bring to remembrance all the things that I've spoken to you. And he will guide you into the truth. And that means the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write the epistles. And by the way, the word epistle just simply means a letter. A letter written to the church to help the church live out the teachings of Jesus in a corporate expression as the church. Every letter written in your New Testament is like as if Jesus spoke through a person to tell you how you ought to live in light of Jesus dwelling in your life. The, the, the epistles are corrective sometimes sometimes. Sometimes they're revelatory, opening up our eyes to see things that Jesus didn't even fully unpack. And sometimes the epistles lead us into practical things that Jesus only touched upon, but they expanded and elaborated on 
in the epistles. But truly you're getting the words of our Lord Jesus Christ through reading the book of Ephesians. Like any book of the Bible, you don't need to see red print to get the words of Christ. The words of Christ are all throughout scripture, actually. In fact, it says in the book of Hebrews and in Psalms, the volume of the book was written of him. All of your Bible is a message from God to us. It's been said the Bible's your B-I-B-L-E, your basic instructions before leaving earth. That's pretty good. I, I kind of love to remind you that the Bible is an inspired text that leads you to live an inspired life. And the daily bread allows you to be daily dead so that Jesus lives in you instead. That, that's always important to remember. <laughs> the word of God is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And this word has so much to say to us about our identity as the church. It's really called the church epistle. In many scholars would refer to it as that. It's also an epistle that shows our great riches in Christ. And there's so many things to see here. Uh, we're going to look at the communion we have with Jesus. We're going to look at the community we have as the church. We're going to look at the commission we have to be soldiers for Christ. And so one of the things I want you to know is the last book we went through was the book of Colossians. And there's something about the book of Colossians and Ephesians that go hand in hand. Let me, let me point this out to you, if we could put that up. Colossians and Ephesians go hand in hand because Colossians proclaims and defends Christ as the head. Whereas Ephesians reveals the church as Christ's living body. And so you think about this. The Bible says that when you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The former things are passed away. So Colossians is showing you you have a head, that's Jesus. But Ephesians shows you you're connected to all these believers as a body. And the head and the body make the new man. So you're a new creation in Christ because you have Christ as head and you're the church as the body. And it's really important to see these two epistles together. By the way, he wrote them together. He wrote them in the same place at the same time, in prison, in house arrest in Rome. When Paul was penning to Colossae about the head, he was penning to Ephesus and to the surrounding churches about the body. And this epistle was meant to go out to all the churches. And so there are three areas that I want you to observe, three areas as we look at the book of Ephesians that you're going to focus on. Let's put this up. One of them has to do with the fact that we have the holiness of God in our lives. The holiness of our communion with Christ is beautifully seen through Ephesians. But not only our holiness, but our togetherness. You're going to see the oneness of the body of Christ through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 4 tells us that there's one body and one spirit and one hope and one faith and one Lord, and one baptism, and one God, and Father of all, who's above all, and in all, and through us all. We have a beautiful togetherness of the church body as a community, but we also have the effectiveness. In fact, Ephesians 4, it says that when we come together as the body, it's the effective working by which each part does its share. Every part of the body has an effective working when we are harmoniously united together and functioning together. So notice the three things. The holiness of our communion with Christ, the togetherness of the church, body as a community, and the effectiveness, effectiveness of the church in warfare and in our mission in following our Lord Jesus Christ. There's been a lot of epistles, uh, a lot of commentaries about the epistle of Ephesians, a lot of letters in our New Testament, but Ephesians carries a very unique strand of teaching about the church that's perhaps above all other epistles in the New Testament. If you want to really learn who you are as the church, this is the epistle to go to. In fact, in Ephesians 1, there's not a slide for this, but listen very carefully. In Ephesians 1, you see Christ um, revealing to us the church is a body because we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In Ephesians 2, we see the church as a building, a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. In Ephesians 3, the church is a mystery revealed by Paul to show the eternal purpose. In Ephesians 4, the church is the new man, growing up and being edified. In Ephesians 5, the church is the bride, being united with Christ. And in Ephesians 6, the church is a troop, a soldier, an army, standing against the wiles of the devil. So the church is a body, a building, a mystery, a new man, a bride, and a troop, all at the same time. Watch Mani, the great Chinese teacher in China, you know, brought out something so beautiful in his observation of the book of Ephesians. He noticed three key verbs. 
how the Christian, the saint, sits, walks, and stands in this book. In the beginning, in the first two chapters, we see him seated with Christ. In the next two chapters, three and four, and in five, you see him walking. The believer is walking out their faith in love, and in the spirit, and in wisdom, and in light. And then you get to chapter six in Ephesians, and the believer's standing their ground against the wiles of the devil. And I love that. Sit, walk, and stand. Can we put that up? Sit, walk, stand. Three great things. And notice, because we're seated with Christ, that's why we walk. Notice the order. I am what I am because Christ made me that way. I do what I do because of who I am. I walk in light of my seated position in Christ. So once I know I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places, I can walk in love. I can walk in the spirit. I can walk in wisdom. I can walk in light. And stand. We stand our ground against the wiles of the devil because I don't have to be the one to move. The devil's got to flee. You know, when there's a conflict between the devil and God's people, the, the devil's one who's supposed to leave every time. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will? Flee. He will flee. So what does that tell us? The believer stays. The believer stands the ground. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. He is our defense. We shall not be moved. And not only that, the Bible tells us that if God is for us, who can be against us? The believer stands. But notice it's in a divine order. You don't stand until you're walking. You've got to be living your life out in faith. And you're not living your life out in faith until you have faith in the revelation of what God has done in giving you an identity in heaven. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So sit, walk, and stand are three very powerful pictures here. Now, there's an outline for the book of Ephesians that I want to give to you as well. Another kind of outline. I like to call it your positional, your practical, and your tactical. Now, in chapters 1 through 3, you really see the revelation of sitting with Christ in the heavenly places as well as you think about your position. I added chapter 3 in there because chapter 3 is a very unique chapter in the book of Ephesians. It's really Paul almost taking an intermission to say, let me take a big step back and I'm going to tell you in a big picture from the beginning of time to the end of time how the church was always on God's heart, including all Jews and all Gentiles. Everybody who comes to Christ becomes a new creation. So chapter 3 really introduces the position so powerfully and revelatory, but in the first three chapters, you get your positional teachings by Paul. In chapters four and five, it's the most practical section of the book. Everything spoken in chapter four and five is giving you clear instructions for husbands, for wives, for parents, for children, for prayer warriors, for servants, for employees, so to speak. Everything you need practically, read chapters 4 and 5. Listen, you want to know how to live the Christian life? Get familiar with chapter 4 and 5 of Ephesians. It really goes hand in hand with Romans chapter 12, one of the other most practical teachings in the New Testament for Christian living. And so it's very practical. But when you get to chapter 3, you realize we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so... We have to learn to put on our full armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, take up the shield of faith so I can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one and take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I'm always going to keep the word in my heart and speak it out and testify of who the Lord is. And that's why it's tactical. It's very much about our spiritual stance against the devil. And so you see the sit, walk, stand shown here and you see them in an outline of the positional, practical, and tactical. So this book is an awesome epistle. It was written by Paul the Apostle in about uh, 62 AD when Paul was in prison in Rome. And he wrote this to the church of Ephesus. But mind you, some people will tell you that in ancient manuscripts, the word Ephesus wasn't always there. Some would say this was a letter to, the, uh, to Laodicea because of a reference made in chapter 4. Others would say that this was a letter written to all the churches. But I think the point is, it was definitely written to Ephesus because Paul is specific enough in other places. But the idea of why some of the manuscripts may have changed is because this letter was so universally important that there were some that would say, don't just focus on a church in Ephesus. Focus on the church wherever the church gathers that you need to apply the positional, practical, and tactical realities of this epistle. Now, let me say this to you. For those of you who are also interested in some background here. Paul wrote this epistle, as I said, when he was in house arrest in Rome, 
And it was in this particular time period where Paul wrote several other letters. I told you Colossians already. But he also wrote Philippians and he wrote Philemon when he wrote this letter. These are called the prison epistles. Simply because Paul wrote them in prison. Now, Paul the Apostle had an interesting background in Ephesus. If you remember, in his missionary journeys, he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach in the region where Ephesus was, the prominent center. You can read about that in Acts 16, verse 6. But God had other works for Paul to do before he arrived there. I would suggest to you that Paul had to receive more from the Lord before he could write a letter to the church about the church. Listen, it is no small subject we're getting into because I believe one of the, listen to me now, everybody in this room, listen carefully. One of the most undefined and misunderstood realities in Christian living today is what the church is and how we're supposed to function as the church. Did you hear me? The average Christian in the West thinks of church as a building. The average Christian in the West attends services. But not a single Christian can quote a single scripture on where the church ever was a building or ever provided services. The church equals the people of God. In scripture, the church is the ecclesia. Some say ecclesia. But the ecclesia is the called out people of God. Ekleo, kleo is this word in Greek that means to call out. And you can't enter the church until you call out to the Lord. Once you call out to the Lord, you're called out of the world. And you're the ecclesia. You're an assembly of people. You're a body of believers. You are an identity that's corporate. So many Christians don't understand this. Instead of going to church, you ought to say the church is going to the building. Instead of saying, hey, I went to the service, you ought to say, I came to bring service to God. Instead of saying, you know, uh, I, what church are you a part of and what church do you go to? We, we ought to first of all say, I'm a follower of Jesus and everybody who follows Jesus is a part of the church with me. We like to break up churches and denominations in our day. We like to break up churches in movements today and in family and some even use the Old Testament term tribes. I would say to you, all of that can do an injustice to helping us to see that the church is a revelatory identity that Christ birthed on Calvary's cross when out of his side came blood and water and Jesus gave birth to a new creation known as the church. And we are the very expression today of Jesus Christ on this earth. The church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Where do I get that? The last verse of Ephesians 1. The church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is so needed today. Now, why would God reveal the church so powerfully in a letter written to Ephesus? Well, let me say this first. The first time Jesus mentioned the church was in Matthew chapter 16 when he went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, Philip was the Caesar who wanted a statue made of himself. And so in that place of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I've been to that very spot a few different times. And in that spot is an actual place where they believe they used to cast people into this Hades. And as a result, this place was a place where you would have a connection to death. But Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Those gates that lead toward Hades has no uh, bearing or, or confrontation with the church because we're spiritual and because we're eternal and because we're in Jesus and because Jesus won the victory on Calvary. Are you with me? And because he resurrected from the dead, nothing can come against us because the dead is dead. Jesus put to death death. Jesus conquered the grave. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And as a result, he's building his church. You right now are a part of the building up of the church. When Christians gather in the name of Jesus to be built up in Jesus, we're seeing the church built up even right now. In real time, the church is growing. In real time, we're being conformed to the image of Jesus. In real time, we're living stones being fit together, as Peter says, because Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Are you with me? Now, brothers and sisters, listen. 
Jesus mentioned the church in Caesarea Philippi, but Paul speaks to the church writing to Ephesus. And very similarly, similarly, you have the contrast between man-made deities and the God divine head. And so in, if, in Ephesians or in Ephesus, you have what's known as one of the biggest cities of the world in the ancient world at the time when this letter was written. It was second only to Rome. And it boasted 300,000 inhabitants, so it was big. It, was the, it had the largest Greek temple ever constructed, the Temple of Diana. I was going to get a picture for you, but I couldn't get one uh, before I got this morning. I, I, I actually forgot to get it. I'm so sorry. But I was going to show you the picture. <laughs> And the Temple of Diana, you, you, you can Google it these days, you know, you can find it. But the Temple of Diana was this structure so big. It, 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 was, it was quite a monstrosity. It was one of the seven great wonders of the ancient world. And it was 400 feet long and 200 feet wide. And this was in Ephesus, where God would say, I'm going to teach you about the church here in this epistle. And when Paul was forbidden to go there, he would later come back on a second missionary journey after he had taken a special vow in Acts 18. And when Paul returned on his third missionary journey, Apollos, who you might know have heard that name, had been presiding there, but had not yet received the spirit. And so Apollos needed to be brought into the church. And in order for Paul, Apollos to be brought into the church, he had to understand the church. And I think that Paul's letter opened up to everyone, especially because of men like Apollos who are eloquent in scripture, but not understanding the identity of the church as Christ would dwell in people. Paul spent two years in the school of Tyrannus where he educated people about what the church was and about what the, the new covenant life was all about. And so about three years total, Paul had spent time in Ephesus and you can read about it in Acts chapter 19 and in Acts chapter 20, he speaks to Ephesian elders, his parting words. But the key to the book of Ephesians is seeing the treasure that Paul gives to us concerning the position of being in Christ Jesus. If you don't get the phrase in Christ Jesus right, the whole epistle won't make sense to you. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. <laughs> to be in Christ Jesus is not metaphorical. And it's not theological only. It is as practical as it gets. Listen, Paul says in Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but... Christ lives in me. And the life, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so brothers and sisters, know this. Christ is living in you by his spirit and you are in him by his grace. You have been brought near to the, by the blood of Christ and you are in him and he is in you. And your union, the doctrine of union, the union you have with Jesus Christ is what Christian living is meant to be about. And if you understand the union of Christ, then you're, you're able to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, realizing every Christian who has Christ in them, you're already connected to. Christians don't have to create unity. They have to keep unity. But you, even, you need to know what you're united in. And what you're united in is the same spirit in me, is the same spirit in you. We all have Christ in each other as Christians. And that's so powerful. It's so essential. It's like all of us need to be for all of him. And that's one of the phrases you could just sum up the whole book of Ephesians in. All of us for all of him. We as the church as a reflection of his grace and of his glory. So let's jump into the text, shall we? Verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of of God. Now notice letters in those days did not start with who you were writing to, but who was writing. So it's very known right in the beginning, Paul is writing. Paul is writing as an apostle. Now why does he start with his identity as an apostle? Well, let me say this to you. When you say the word apostle, it comes with authority. Because there were three kinds of apostles. Listen very carefully. If you've never heard this, this will help you to see something as it unfolds to this day. Listen very carefully. God is a triunity, a trinity, a trinitas, as they say in Latin. 
The word Trinity doesn't show up in your Bible, but the reality of the Trinity is all throughout the Bible. God is one God, but he is the Father, he is the Son, he is the Holy Spirit. One God eternally existing as three distinct persons. Together, they are the Godhead. When God speaks, he often says, let us, or our, as you see in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our image and our likeness, in verse 26. Why does God speak in a plural way? Because God revealed himself to humanity in those three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are a reflection of God. So we are, in some ways, although some people argue over whether we're a dichotomy or a trichotomy, I would say to you, scripturally, specifically, shows us that at times, we are spirit, soul, and body. And as a result, we are a reflection of the triunity of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. But there's only one of me, and there's only one God. Now that's quite amazing. It's a mystery. But life revolves around mysteries that have to be revealed to us. Just like identity has to be shown to us. Paul had many things he could identify himself with, but he was an apostle. Now the word apostle means one who is sent. A sent one. So listen to this. The triunity of God all does sending. Number one, the father sent the son. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus is called the apostle, the sent one. In John 3, 16 and 3, 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent the son, number one. Number two, the son sent the twelve. One of the twelve was Judas Iscariot. He betrayed the Lord. He got replaced by Matthias. But later on, we see that Jesus himself calls Paul the apostle. And there were other apostles as well. But I'm going to explain that in a second. There was 12 apostles that Jesus directly called. 13 if you count Judas. But he was null and void because he was never a true follower, but the son of perdition. So listen very carefully. Jesus called 12. The Holy Spirit, number three, calls all of us in one way or another, to be sent. In John 20, 21, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I send you. In Acts 1, 8, it says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In Acts chapter 13, in verses 2 and in verse 4, it specifically says, the Holy Spirit sent, said, sent, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. And then in chapter four of Acts 13, it specifically says, and the Holy Spirit sent them. So what do you get? The father sent the son, the son sent the 12, the 12, or I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit sends others today. We call them missionaries. We sometimes call them church planters, but all of us in the church are sent by God one way or the other. Are you with me on that? Was that helpful? I'm willing to stop right now and just clarify anything if if you need any help with that. This is teaching for you. Okay? These get recorded for other people, but my primary focus is on you. I want you to be taught and, and taught well. Listen very carefully. As a result of this, Paul the Apostle was an apostle of Jesus Christ, notice, by the will of God. And it took the will of God to interrupt Paul's life because Paul was a religious man in a religious system who had religious practices that were getting in the way of a relationship with the living God. How sad that there's many people stuck in that same rut. But God, by his will, is drawing people out of darkness and into the light, out of structures that hold us back into the glorious liberty of the Spirit. And he's teaching us how to be men and women who live the life of faith in him. And so one of the things I want you to realize is, is that as we consider the will of God, what does the will of God mean? Everybody listen to this. This is so important. The will of God is God's divine desire and purposeful intentionality for your life. And God has a will for each one of you. God wills that you live, not die. That's why Jesus undid death, to make sure that goes on forever. God wills that you love, 
Because God is love and he wants his love poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. God wills for you to serve because all of us who have been served by God, we want to serve him back. But listen, there's many specific things God will, will, will for your life. He will show you his will. And you have to seek him for that. You have to read the scriptures for that. And this brings up my first key point in this message this morning about your God-given identity, and it's this. You will never be who God calls you to be or do what God calls you to do unless you receive and believe the word of God. Now, why is this so important? Because Paul writing an epistle tells you it was the will of God that he was an apostle writing this epistle to teach you about the church so you too would know the will of God for your life. You cannot do what God tells you to do unless you're a man or a woman who reads the word of God and who hears the word of God, receives it and believes it. Do you know why people are confused today? They've not received the word and they don't believe in the word. And if you don't receive and believe the word of God, guess what you will receive? The word of man. And since the word of man is always changing, so is identity. Since the word of man is unsure and it's always based on new studies and new paradigm shifts, cultural norms, the world is confused in their identity because they don't receive and believe the word of God. They receive and believe the word of man or a politician or their favorite rock star and musician. And it's amazing to me that when a musician who's been gifted and graced by God to sing well or play the guitar well says something, the whole world responds to it as if like that's the will of God for my life. An actor, an actress, because they're gifted it on the screen. We're supposed to imitate them in life. Kids wanting to be superheroes. Women wanting to look like the perfect, you know, um, bo- you know uh, computerized images of a look that can't even be recreated without some form of plastic surgery or touching up on the screen. And we're thinking we're supposed to look like that in real life. And people pay as much money as possible to, to imitate. Why? Because my identity is wrapped up in that identity. That's fashion. That's cool. That's hip. That's popular. That's relevant. And I want you to realize... What good is it to be relevant on earth if you're not reverent first to the things in heaven? Because God created you. Male and female, he created them. He chose where you would be born. He chose when you would be born. He chose the family you would live live with. He chose whether you were male or female. He chose the number of days of your life and he fashioned them. And God would say, my will is that you start with what I've said. That you just accept what I've given to you. My heart breaks, and I'm going to speak very pastorally here, and fatherly. I'm so concerned for young people today. I'm so concerned for teenagers today who don't know that God's word affirms them and confirms to them what is true about them. And if they don't know what God's word says, they'll believe all kinds of lies that will lead them down a path of experimentation, curiosity, perversity, obscurity, and ultimately confusion. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. He's the author and finisher of faith. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the... Word of God. When I was young, I wanted to be a major league baseball player. But whether or not I ever became a baseball player would never be about my identity. God had to teach me that. I was having the best year of my life, my junior year of high school, one of the Orange County leaders in Southern California for batting average. And then I got injured being in a car accident with a friend. We got rear-ended and my back kind of got a little loose in the discs or whatever. And I got the... um, The sciatic nerve thing that, you know, the pain that anybody have that pain shoots down the leg and it's not a very fun and pleasant thing. I had it for, you know, about a month and a half. I was able to make it back just in time for playoffs and so forth. But I remember a very key lesson at that time. Joey, who you are is not a baseball player. That's just what you do. There's a difference between what defines you and what describes you. I'm defined by what God says. I can be described by what I do and what I look like and what people say. But God doesn't want me to live my life based on a description. He wants me to live my life based on a definition of who he says I am. 
And according to scripture, I am a child of the living God because I received Jesus Christ into my life. According to scripture, I'm a, I'm a son, I'm a servant, I'm a saint. According to scriptures, dear brothers and sisters, and I wrote this some years ago around the time when I was young in this, and I want to read this to you. I called it, I'm more than a conqueror. It goes like this. I'm completely forgiven, infinitely blessed, and forever living for Christ. I will not be shaken, forsaken, overtaken, or destroyed. I will never quit, give up, or lose heart. I'm employed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I will keep going, keep fighting, keep sowing, keep lighting the worlds with the gospel. If it's possible, I'll take it anywhere, everywhere, even if the situation may be hostile. I'm defined by God, devoted to Christ, and dependent on his spirit. I'm redeemed by the Lamb, refined by the fire, and running this race until I hear it. Those triumphant words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I am the beloved bride of Christ who is destined to share in his glory. Although sin is rampant, I'm called to turn the tide and not hide the sharing of his story. I'm fully equipped with the word of Christ dwelling in me richly, the promises of my father deep within me, and the spirit of God overflowing just to switch me into a living witness that stays in this. No matter how hard this spiritual fitness, I will be resolved to remain on my enemy's hit list. <laughs> I am determined to my savior. I will keep drawing near. When I walk through the valley, I will persevere without fear. I'm on a mission like a pilgrim passing through the realm of time. I will be caught up into heaven and return in the saintly line. I have the creator of the whole universe continually on my side. With God for me, not against me, I will rest and remain. And in his word, I will simply abide. I will sit, walk, and stand, and he shall soon deliver. I will not hesitate or deviate, nor let the enemy make me shiver. I will surrender only to Christ and put on no one else above me. I am more than a conqueror in this life, united with the one who loved me. When the battles arise, I will lift up my eyes from whence comes my salvation. I will pray today and press forward to the prize until the whole world gives him a standing ovation. So before this anthem, so before this anthem is over and my days are all done, I will forever be more than a conqueror for in Jesus, the victory has been won. Amen. 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 So brothers and sisters, you have to know who you are. You have to be defined by the will of God, and that is revealed to us in the word of God. And so Paul would go on to say, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, brothers and sisters, you're a saint. You either are a saint or an ain't, but there's nothing in between. You either are for him or you're against him. You're either on his side and therefore you abide, or you are on the slide and therefore you will go for a ride wherever the world takes you. You will always be a product of your environment and your circumstances until God calls you up and over and you're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And when God renews you, when God renews you, he replaces your old identity and regraces you with his. And I believe today we need to hear this word over and over and over again. Some people say, Joey, how did I become a saint? People, if you've grown up in a traditional church, if you've grown up in a religious tradition, you think you become a saint by good works that you do. I tell you this, you become a saint because of the good work that God's son has already done. I am Saint Joseph, Saint Joey. You are Saint whoever because you have Jesus Christ living inside of you. And because you have Jesus living inside of you, you have a new identity. Now, let me say this, heart to heart. I don't fully grasp how the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. But I know that the scriptures tell me God drew me by his spirit. That the scriptures tell me that God opened my eyes. And that God made a way for me to hear his word and enabled me enabled me to be able to believe and receive him. But I also believe in scripture that I had to believe and receive him and that God holds me responsible whether I do or don't. And I don't always know how God's sovereign will fully reconciles with man's free will. We have theological debates of Calvinism and Arminianism, you know, all these um, kind of things. But let me just say this to you. All of you in this room, if you read your Bible, then you just let the Bible speak. 
In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul says, I want you to learn in us not to think beyond what is written, lest one of you become puffed up one against the other. Just let the word speak. When the word shows you that God is choosing you and God is selecting you and God is calling you, let the weight of scripture lead you to receive that. When you read in scripture, unless you repent, and if you believe, and as many as come, and if anyone desires, and, and, and God was saying you were not willing, that's showing you that you're responsible. And remember, our responsibility is our response to God's ability. There's no doubt that God has to be involved every single time. There's no way he's left it independent to you. But he has involved you in the process. Why? Because God made a choice to give you choice. God will enable you to make a choice, but he won't make the choice for you. And as a result, I believe in scripture that this is something that's a mystery. And I'm okay leaving it at that. I'm okay letting the scriptures just give weight where the scriptures give weight and always letting the text drive us each time. When you look at the totality of scripture, we get doctrines of grace, we get doctrines of repentance, we get doctrines of, of, of man's responsibility and God's sovereignty all at the same time. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, was asked once, how did you make sense of God's sovereignty and man's free will? How do you reconcile them together? Spurgeon once responded, I wouldn't try. I never reconcile friends. I believe it's important to know that God's sovereignty and man's free will are not pinned against each other. They're compatible together. Like two rails of a railroad track, they're together so that things can move forward. God has created a world where we are involved. It's not just one hand involved, but many hands involved. Uh, when you put a hand on the table, you'll find that Satan has his hand on the table and God has his hand over everything. And since God has the final word and the last word, and since he saw all the hands before they were made, God can speak the ends from the beginnings before they even happen. But one thing I do know is that we need to be responsible for what is revealed to us. To whom much is given, much is required. To him who has, more will be given. And so brothers and sisters, I, I, I want you to understand that God is calling all of us today to be a people who walk in the fullness of what he's given. We're saints and we are faithful. And to be faithful, we have to be obedient to what God says and to do what God has given us to do. And that's where it says grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you notice that grace comes before peace? Grace to you and peace from. Notice that grace comes to us from heaven because it's God giving to us. But peace comes from the grace that's received. Once you receive grace, you get the peace of God. The peace of God is the result of the grace that is given. And that is why there's a great principle here. There's a great principle, even in understanding grace leading to peace, is that identity determines activity. Can we put up this slide? Identity determines activity. This is called the be before do principle. I, I gave a message on this many years ago. I've taught this many, many times. Um, this is a principle you always have to understand in scripture. And, and, and it's right here in Psalm 1 too. Do you remember in Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. Then notice this. Everybody pay attention. He shall, notice, be like a tree. He shall be like a tree who produces its fruit in its season, whose leaf will not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Notice the doing that leads us to prosper is the result of the being of where we're planted. If you're planted in Jesus, Jesus comes out. The root determines the fruit. When Jesus comes into my heart, that's the start of a new growth in my life. And the Christian life is stages of growth throughout the ages of life. And so it's a progression. And you don't get a progression without understanding there's a process. A, pro a process leads to the progress. You're going to go through things. You're going to go through trials and hardships and you're going to be challenged. And so you have to go through the storms of life. But you can still produce your fruit in its season and leaf not wither when you are doing what God's called you to do. So this be before do principle is so key in Ephesians. You learn your identity, then you do your activity. You start being who you are in Jesus, spending time with him, and then you'll look like him and act like him and do the things that he calls you to do. 
Matthew 12 verse 33 says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else the tree bad and its fruit bad. But every tree is known by its fruit. Now, let me say this to you, brothers and sisters. There's a second point here that's key. As sure as grace to you and peace from God our Father, notice that in verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This brings up another key point I want you to notice. We're blessed because of what Jesus did. And what Jesus did was based out of obedience. But the only way Jesus can ever obey is if he humbles himself before the Father in submission. See, before he had a mission, he had a submission. Sub means going below. Jesus submitted, putting himself under the Father, and then his mission was carried out following the Father's commands. He says, I only do what my Father tells me to do. I only speak what my Father gives me to speak. So look at this key point number two. If Christ is the head and we are the body, it is our natural starting point in our new identity to be humble and lowly. Because that's how Jesus demonstrates a life that pleases him. Can I just say something to you right now? I am nothing apart from Christ. But in Christ, I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. It, it's that big of a contrast. Apart from Christ, I am nothing. I can do nothing. I will not accomplish anything that's eternal. I can only be a wind that blows through the earth for a short time like a vapor that has its moments of glory and fades away like the grass of the fields and the flower which is gone. But if I'm in Christ, I'm eternal. And if I'm in Christ, I can do eternal things. So brothers and sisters, we have to be willing to humble ourselves. Do you notice that in Ephesians 4 verse 1, in the very heart of this epistle, everybody look at this verse. In the heart of this epistle, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. That's another identification Paul's saying. I'm an apostle sent, but I'm in prison because I'm submitted to God. I'm doing whatever God says. But he did that joyfully. He's not like, I'm in prison. He's like, do it. Paul's like, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I'm in jail right now writing epistles, but I'm free. And wherever I go, I'm free because I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. But then notice it says this right after that. With all lowliness and gentleness. If you're going to walk worthy of your identity, you need to know who you are. And in order to know who you are, you need to be humble and to be lowly. Many of you have heard of uh, Tim Keller. He's the um, pastor of, well, he was the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church. I have a good friend who pastors there, a couple of people I know over there. And um, Tim Keller was recently writing on something. I thought this is an interesting quote, very much goes with what we're talking about today. He said this, quote, the Roman Empire says, you Christians, this is back in the old days. The Roman Empire said back in the old days, you Christians are too exclusive, you threaten the social order because you won't honor all deities. Remember back in Roman times, there was a worship of many gods. And so you guys were exclusive back then in the first century because you don't worship all deities. The modern West today, 2,000 years later, says this. You Christians are still too exclusive. You threaten the social order because you won't honor all identities. Wow, I thought that was a profound statement. Something for the whole church to ponder. In the old days, it was you don't worship enough deities. In this day, it's you don't worship enough identities. And I thought, that's very profound. That's something worth just thinking about. Because a lot of our culture today is confused and it's because we don't humble ourselves. Listen, if there's no God, you're the highest being on the planet. And in the universe, because you're the head of the evolutionary chain, you're the, you're the head of it all. In fact, what started as an accident has apparently ended up with some kind of meaningful purpose because everybody wants to give purpose to their life. And I always find that interesting. If you don't believe that there was a purpose in the beginning, why do you try to find a purpose now? If there was a purpose in the beginning, then life has purpose. If there was an accident in the beginning, then life is accidental. Who cares who you are? If, if you are a boy or a girl or a dog or a cat, it's all accidental anyway. My point is, if there's a purpose... God has an intentionality for us. And listen, 
so many people are confused. You know, I was like researching all the different kind of articles out there on identity. And in a TED talk, you know, many of you have heard of America Ferreira, actor, director, producer, activist. She said, quote, presence creates possibility. Who we see thriving in the world teaches us how to see ourselves, how to think about our own values, and how to dream about our futures. If I could go back and say anything to the nine-year-old, to that nine-year-old dancing in the den, dreaming her dreams about herself, I would say my identity is not my obstacle. My identity is my superpower. Because the truth is, I am what the world looks like. You are what the world looks like. Collectively, collectively, we are what the world actually looks like. And in order for our systems to reflect that, they don't have to create a new reality. They just have to stop resisting the one we already live in. Now, I know what she's saying, and it's very interesting that she talks about, why don't we just embrace the fact that our world is diverse, we're all unique, we're all individuals. Totally. That's right on. But you have to stop and ask the question, why? Why are we unique and different? It's because God created a masterpiece out of each and every human being. And we are his workmanship. But we're created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Where do you get that verse? Ephesians 2 verse 10. And a lot of people today don't understand who we are because they don't know who God is. And that's what gives you your worth, your value, your breath, your life, and your length of days. As a Christian, I'm a believer individually. I am the body corporately. And I am the bride prophetically. And that is so important to understand. When John the Baptist was asked who you are, he said, I'm not the Christ. Well, who are you then? A prophet? Are you this? Are you that? He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. In other words, John the Baptist was able to say, my life is about Jesus. I'm defined by Jesus. I'm refined by Jesus. And now that Jesus is here, I must decrease and he must increase. And that brings up my final point for today. And don't miss this about identity. What you have received from the Lord is the basis for what you can minister to others. And I want you to think about this for a minute. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, John the Baptist, when he was fading out, phasing out his ministry to point people to Jesus, because he was a, a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He says this in John three twenty-seven to 28. He says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Now, brothers and sisters, can I just encourage you with this? You also have been sent before the Lord Jesus in the second coming. See, John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord in the first coming, but we are before Jesus in the second coming. And one of the things that we need to be able to do is to know that my ministry on however God wants to use me in these days is based on what God has revealed to me about who he is, about who I am as the church, and about the gifts and calling that has been placed on my life in stewardship. We can only minister out of the basis of what God has given to us, what we've received from the Lord. And that's why it's so important that we understand that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places are in Christ. You want to know what a crisis is? An identity crisis? It's as simple as this. An identity crisis is when you don't know who Christ is. That's a crisis. If you don't know who Christ is, you have a crisis. And people have identity crises because they don't know what it means to be in Christ. And so we have to realize that our identity determines our activity and it's, it's the basis of my ministry. Knowing who I am determines what I do. If I was to play on the New York Yankees and I wore a Boston Red Sox uniform, it wouldn't work. Because if you wear a Red Sox uniform, you've got to be in a different side of the field, in a different dugout. You're going to be scoring runs for the other team, not for your team. And you have to realize your identity determines what you are. Not just that you're on the Yankees versus the Red Sox, but what position do you play? If I'm a center fielder, which is what I played when I ended my college career, I'd have to go to center field. Why do you go to center field? Because I'm a center fielder. That's what the center fielder does. Why are you preaching the gospel? Because I'm a Christian, but God's also called me to be a pastor and teacher. So that's what I'm doing. See, what I'm doing is based out of my position in the body of Christ. Who gave me that position? Well, I received it from the Lord. 
Just like John says, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Whatever position I am, that determines what I do. You say, Joey, I don't know what my position is then. Then go to your coach and see where he puts you in the lineup. How do I do that? Go talk with him. Where is he? He's everywhere. Can I make an appointment? He's already got you on his calendar. You can talk to God all day long and ask him the question, God, what do you have for me? Remember one of the first messages I gave in this building was speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Some of us need to go back to that lesson and just say, God, what do you have for me? Because I don't feel like I'm functioning. I don't feel like my spring is released. I don't feel like I know who I am. Now, there's so much more I can say on this, but I am going to stop because of time. But I'm going to leave you with one last thought about our blessings today. Let me go to this last slide. This last slide has to do with all the things that make up my identity. And and, and as you read the rest of the verses, we see beautiful things about who we are. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so we see all of these beautiful things about who we are. In verse three, I'm blessed. In verse four, I'm chosen. In verse four, I'm holy. In verse four, I'm without blame. That's awesome. In verse five, I'm predestined. In verse, that means that God beforehand knew that I would always be with him. Adopted, that means that I'm a son of God. I'm I'm brought into the family of God as a son. In verse 6, I'm accepted. God's not trying to see if if, if we measure up to his approval. Jesus Christ already measures up to his approval. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And if you have Jesus, he's pleased with you. You're accepted and you're redeemed. You've been delivered of your sin. Your debt's been paid and you're forgiven of all of your sin and washed as far as the east is from the west. Now, there's a whole lot more than this, but this is just in the first eight verses that we get these beautiful identifications of who we are. And I want to end today saying to you today, praise the Lord for this. Praise the Lord that God gave you an identity. Praise the Lord today that you don't have to leave this building wondering who you are. You need to be in wonder that God, who's who's awesome in power and the creator of the heavens and the earth, knows you by name, called you by name, And when you called upon the name of his son, Jesus Christ, you were given a brand new identity. The old things have passed away and all things have become new. And today your identity is as sure as the word of God. Did you hear that? Your identity is as sure as the word of God. And to the degree that you're struggling with your identity, it's probably to the degree that you receive and believe the word of God going back to the first point. If you don't believe the word of God, then your identity is shaky today. It's wobbly. I don't know who I am. Maybe I need a tattoo to tell me who I am. Maybe I need a hat to wear of who I am. Maybe I need a badge. Maybe I need this. And I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. I'm just simply saying all you need to know who you are is what the word of God declares about you. And when you read the word, the word will read you. And before you know it, God will be so alive in you. You'll be like, I know who I am. I'm a child of the living God. I'm more than a conquering Christ. I'm his beloved bride and I'm at rest. And you get the peace because of the grace that gave you that identity in the first place. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Father, thank you so much for this time in your word. Thank you so much, God, for the grace that saved us and for the life that leads us into the newness of who we are, the trueness of who you are, determines it all. Father, I ask that we would just grow in the grace and knowledge of you every day, that the word of God would define us, that the word of God would refine us, and we wouldn't let the world dictate any more who we're going to be and what we're supposed to look like and what we need to have. But God, we would just rest assured that to be in Christ is to be a new creation and to be one with you is to be in glory forever. God, We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And I just pray, Lord, we would rest in our identity, the God-given identity that we've all received, and that no one here in this place would waver or wobble anymore about trying to discover who they are, but they would read the Bible and embrace every teaching in Scripture until the whole picture is given of who we are, that we are the sons and the daughters of God. We are the bride of Christ the body, which is the church. 
Lord, let the book of Ephesians make things straight for us. May it illuminate and bring enlightenment to our lives about what it means to live as the church in these days. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much, Lord. We praise you. We just want to worship you because of what you've given to us. Let's, let's worship him right now.